A project codenamed HLX was born shortly before the completion of Half-Life Alex. A year later, Valve began hiring a huge number of new employees. Some publicly announced this on social networks like modders and just talented people from the community. And someone just updated their page on LinkedIn. There are dozens of such people. There are some who have just graduated and immediately went to work, but there are also gaming industry veterans who have worked in large studios for up to 10 years. Developers of physical engines for games from Rockstar Games or from the Forza series, where the gameplay is focused on driving cars. Many level designers from ID Software, Epic Games, Respawn Entertainment, Sucker Punch and Raven, who worked on games like Doom Eternal, Fortnite, Apex Legends, Titanfall, Red Dead Redemption, GTA and Call of Duty. Full production of Half-Life Alex lasted about 4 years, while the development of Half-Life X is still going for almost 5. HLX has always shared a common code base with HLVR, as development began before the announcement of the VR game. However, in 2021, developers began actively renaming variables from HLVR to HLX. And a little later, a global cleanup of the engine began, removing all functions and lines that could be associated with a new game in any way. These include the first mentions of new physical vehicles, particles for a dynamic weather system such as snow fog and storm any mention of creatures or objects from the world of Zen and much more. This is not the first time Valve has hidden the number 3 behind the letter X. This was revealed in the Deadlock files where the developers disguised Left 4 Dead 3 as L4DX. As I mentioned in the previous video, one of the key problems due to which the latest iterations of Half-Life 3 were frozen several times is the problem with developing a new engine. Despite the fact that Source 2 began its journey in 2008 with test of graphic rendering and the first attempts to port previous games, the engine suffered from the lack of necessary components. And for the first public demo of Robot Repair at GDC, they had to create a separate engine branch. In 2013, a team of 30 people decided to try to make Left 4 Dead 3 where the action takes place in Morocco. The gameplay included battles with hundreds of zombies in the open world, roughly the same thing that Ben Studios later implemented in Days Gone. However, due to problems with the engine, the game was shelved. Inspired by this idea, David Spire's team began creating a new single-player game with procedurally generated gameplay. Mixed with well-produced stories, characters and locations, the player would be able to constantly replay pre-written situations but each time get a completely new experience. They were inspired by the gameplay of the original Left 4 Dead as it remained exciting and fun no matter how many times you played it. Buildings in the world would change their size, objects spawn in random places, doors and windows open and close. And all this affected the behavior of the player, enemies and navigation in combat. As he later admitted this project was Half-Life 3, but they once again faced engine limitations. This is not Valve's last attempt in procedural generation. The very first prototypes appeared together with the tile gen tool for Alien Swarm. It was possible to generate a unique level based on pre-created rooms that were connected by doors. You could add your rooms separately and try to play this map with friends. Over the next 10 years, we have regularly seen new attempts for various game modes in already existing games. For example, unreleased dungeon mode, mentions of which appeared in Operation Shattered Web for CSGO. In a nutshell, this mode was a dungeon with 16 floors, something similar to the Binding of Isaac. Each floor is a procedurally generated location from pre-created rooms by developers, the same logic as in Alien Swarm. Floors are divided into three levels and each has its own weapons, equipment and opponents. This mode never saw the light of day, but after the release of Counter-Strike 2, mentions and scripts of the new Terror Hunt mode appeared. Based on the files, this mode is a replayable cooperative map where you and your friends move from point A to point B, clear waves of advancing enemies and gradually move deeper into the location. This concept is a bit weird, something like a training aim dungeon crawler map with waves of opponents. In 2015, at the release of Dota 2 Reborn, the developers accidentally left in the files two text documents. They were called HL3 and RPG. The files contained information about the RPG game with mechanics and quests including references to the Combine. They mentioned a complex system of dialogues with non-player characters. A quest system such as destroying a certain number of enemies. Ability to pick up and throw away items. 
procedural spawns for opponents and a realistic day-night cycle. If you watched my previous video about HLX, you probably already realized that Valve began to take ideas out of the box and reuse them for a new game as Source 2 became ready to integrate these features. Now let's talk about all the leaks that have appeared since my last video about the new Half-Life. Go exchange skins on Skins Monkey. Use code Gaben and get up to a $5 bonus. Select a few of your current skins, pick a new one in the same price range and exchange your old and ugly CSGO items to something new and shiny from Counter-Strike 2. Use code Gaben and buy skins much cheaper with a 30 plus 5% top-up bonus. Skins Monkey links and my code down below. Just as they did last time, the developers have begun to remove references to the Half-Life universe. Mentions of Gordon's canonical weapon Crowbar, Impact Damage Mass and Crowbar Impact Damage Scale. Mention of test materials and shaders for raindrops, the intensity, color and scale of which can change. If there is rain, there is also wind and the wind generator container suggests that developers can create wind in the selected area and change its direction and strength. Well, and obviously a fog that can appear and disappear, change its size, density, color, light, interaction, shadow casting and bending around objects. All this once again suggests that the game may have a dynamic weather system that changes depending on certain conditions. This sounds especially good in combination with the new lines M Sky and M Suns in the plural, which may indicate the existence of several global light sources such as a combination of the sun and moon. This again confirms day to night cycle and let's not forget about the huge number of previous finds, which directly mention that weather effects such as rain, fog or wind can change depending on the current time of day. And there's also new improvements to the lighting rig, more details about that in the last video. New navigation system for NPCs and the player in altered gravity. The game can set certain gravitational areas and in some cases one area may be prioritized over another, it depends on the given force. Opponents and the player can smoothly move from one gravitational area to another, which can have completely different shapes. Gravity can change its direction, both repel and attract objects. Judging by the new icons in tools, some areas can be spherical and attract or repel along the diameter relative to their center. We have seen similar mechanics in games such as Prey, Control, Super Mario Galaxy and Dead Space. This can lead to more complex and interesting levels with non-standard geometry and puzzles based on gravity manipulation, which is perfect for the Zen world or other alternative universes. Especially for this feature, the developers also updated the anim graph, so animations of characters and objects can correctly respond to changes in orientation, rotation and attraction to certain points. In general, we can notice a huge number of improvements for navigation and locomotion for non-playable characters. For example, NPCs can navigate separately from specific data that is already set in the game's memory. They will make decisions based on things that are happening in their vision cone. Judging by the strings, the navigation grid will become more dynamic, allowing the NPC to navigate more wisely in ever-changing conditions. If it understands that the route is blocked, it will try to find more complex and interesting routes. At the same time, developers can specify areas where creatures should not move. NPCs can have more complex goals than just moving from point A to point B. Most likely this will be predetermined by the type of creature, a certain location or the current situation. Damage to these creatures can scale depending on the given parameters. They have predefined hitboxes which are used to determine the area in which the NPC takes damage when hit and they indicate a wide variety of opponents ranging from some small freaks to white humans. NPCs can have dynamic collisions, for example, if they are pushed by some physical objects, they will fall as a ragdoll and then get up. A new function for Source 2 called NPC Maker has appeared, which is responsible for spawning new creatures based on certain conditions. For example, if you killed all the enemies, it can start spawning new ones. This is also related to new combat behavior configs. For example, parameters that determine how many and how often enemies appear. Choice of a certain collision type. Standard, disabled and oriented, most likely for unique gravity conditions. They may have some abilities that disappear after use. They can hunt for a certain player and much more. NPC creation system adds a high degree of flexibility and modularity, which will allow developers to create unique characters with different behaviors and interactions with the world around them. In addition to this, a huge, I repeat, huge system related to the destruction of limbs or certain elements of the NPC with their bodies and ragdolls has appeared. Roughly speaking, the player will be able to shoot off their limbs, heads, legs and other body parts. 
The developers are clearly preparing more realistic and brutal combat. Creatures will literally be torn to pieces. At the same time, the destruction of a limb does not mean the death of the enemy. Destruction will affect the appearance. Instead of a whole arm, a piece may fall off and a wound may remain. These injuries will affect the creature's animations, they will limp, hold on to wounds, fall or crawl. Each part of the NPC's body, arms, legs, head, will have its own durability settings and influence behavior during destruction. The destruction of limbs can be interconnected, for example, if you shoot off a leg, the foot will come with it. Destruction of some limbs can be fatal and it is important to mention that it's not only humanoids. This system can also be used for other enemies, such as creatures from Zen or some robots, from which some elements such as armor will fall off. We already kinda saw this in previous Half-Life games. For example, in the first one when a grenade explodes, the creature scatters into pieces of meat. In the second you could cut a zombie in half and in Half-Life Alyx you could shoot at the paws of the ant lions to slow or finish them. Once again there's active work on a new hair system and rendering of individual strands. Their shading, volume and density texture maps, voxel collisions and the division of each strand into several segments. More details about this in the last video, but in a nutshell, this is a new technology for realistic and dynamic hair that reacts to the environment. Their color, density, length, physics, shadows and level of detail can change. In addition, a huge number of innovations for the physical properties of the surface or objects. For example, parameters that specify the values to which an object can heat up before it ignites. How quickly the object absorbs heat from nearby sources. The type of liquid spilled on the surface how long the fuel on objects can burn, determination of particle effects that remain on the ground during bleeding. Plasticity and deformation of objects under stress or after impact while maintaining the final shape. Elasticity and return to its original shape after deformation. Physical hinges to connect to objects and much more. Of course, there are new mentions of vehicles with traces that remain after movement, resistance forces and friction depending on a certain type of surface. The interaction of it with water, wet surfaces and the splash effects. There have been new mentions of HLX in already mentioned debug overlay for locomotion. Also in the shader called Citadel Motion Vectors. Also, in 3 DLL libraries related to the texture compilation, source to tools and particles. A small mention of some Zen animations, along with a strange icon for Zen-related assets that looks like an alien hat. Valve has been pumping the engine for many years. The first visual results could be seen in Half-Life Alyx in the form of photorealistic textures. Or in CS2 for cool water and dynamic voxel smoke. But you have to keep in mind that the first one is a VR game and the second is multiplayer, so it will look much nicer in a single player game for flat screens. As the developers previously stated, the ending of Half-Life Alyx sets the stage for future games. One of the main problems with the plot of the third episode was Gabe Newell, who insisted that instead of the funny ending of the second one, there should be a cliffhanger that would shock the player and lay the foundation for the next game. He believed that one of the main characters had to die. This character turned out to be Eli, but only later the developers will understand that this was a terrible decision. He was the only hope of mankind and his death along with the sucking out the brains meant the end of resistance. Any subsequent events did not make any sense since the combines turned out to be invincible and only Eli knew the plan. More details about this bad ending are described in the plot of Epistle 3 from the original writer Mark Laidlaw. However, the finale of VR game put everything in its place and untied the hands of the writers. During the development of Half-Life Alyx, they did a huge amount of work to show how the world, flora and fauna of Zen affected our reality, before the Combines cremated everything. And in the final hours, they finally shed light on Alex's gravity gloves and Gordon's gravity gun. They are powered by the crystals from Zen. Half-Life games have always been about the manipulation of gravity, space, time and teleportation. And new leaks directly indicate that the developers are going to dig this idea as much as possible. Apparently, it is the crystals that affect gravity in Zen, allowing islands to float in space while attracting everything on their surface. Of course, let's not forget a huge number of new employees who have worked on game physics in large studios for decades. 
At the end of HLA, Alexis' gloves were buffed with Ward energy and the Vortigons are another mystery of the universe. I would suggest that in the next game we will see a new type of gravity gun and it's quite possible that, similar to gloves, it will have a green color. Using it we will be able to influence not only certain objects, but also the entire space around it. In the plot of HLX we may also see the story of another character, the mysterious woman from the end of Alex. According to the developers they have interesting options for how she can be used. In addition, the writers admitted that it's necessary to reveal more information about the mysterious G-Man, and Half-Life Alex was not very suitable for it. Leave an alien in the comments if you watched this far. Be sure to watch the previous video about Half-Life 3 since there is a lot of additional info that sounds extremely interesting in combination with new finds.